Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're really pleased today to have Philippe Faust as our guest. Philippe got his PhD in 2016 with Bernardo Renner at the ETH. He was a postdoc with John Preskill and his group in Caltech, and now is at the Free University in Berlin. And the work he'll tell us today about uncertainty and the quantum error correction for noisy metrology is joint also with John Preskill and Jens Eisert. So Philippe, this uh, screen is yours. Please share your screen and we look forward very much to your talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, does this work? All right. Well, thank you very much for the really kind uh, invitation and introduction. I'm really excited to be able to speak to this absolutely wonderful audience here. Uh, and you know, thanks for taking the time to tune in my talk. Um, this is uh, some uh, kind of a pandemic project that I uh, that I've dragged along uh, the pandemic with these wonderful collaborators. You know, there are Misha Woods, Victor, Joe, Jens, and John. I actually have a slide with uh, my collaborators. And, um, you know, maybe to start off, like, what, you know, to motivate the, the, the my talk. And also because, you know, I figured this is mathematical picture language seminar, I, I could try to draw a few pictures. Um, so <laughs> to motivate my talk, you know, really, in physics, we want to measure things. You know, that's really one of the bases on which physics uh, is, is constructed. So, you know, it's important that we're able to measure distances, time, uh, electromagnetic fields, temperatures, uh, maybe even gravitational waves. And, um, and so, you know, it's a natural question to ask, well, to what accuracy can we determine uh, all of these different quantities that we'd like to measure? And, you know, what are the fundamental limits that we're uh, hitting against? Specifically, quantum mechanics, you know, uh, does play some pretty strong, pretty stringent uh, accuracy limits. You know, there's, you, most of you will probably know the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? If I have two observables that are incompatible, well, there's some inherent uh, uncertainty into being able to measure precisely these observables simultaneously, for instance, position and momentum. We also know that a measurement disturbs the state of the system such that if I, you know, if I come and measure some observable, well, you know, I might be disturbing it as, I might be disturbing my system as much as I'm extracting information about the thing I wanted to measure. And the other thing is, you know, in my talk, I, in my title, you might have seen time energy, uh, the words time and energy, and there we're hitting again uh, against another aspect of quantum mechanics, which is there's no universal, you know, time observable in the same way that you have a position or a Hamiltonian or a momentum operator. So time is itself not an operator in quantum mechanics. So when you want to um, establish some type of time energy uncertainty principle, it's important to kind of clarify a little bit more what we mean by this uncertainty of measuring time. You know, it could be something like, well, it's the time it takes for an observable to change by you know, some expectation value to change by an amount that's at least some standard deviation, something like that. All right, so kind of now let me uh, present the setting that I will be considering during this talk. Uh, I will be looking at quantum systems. Now let's think of it as a quantum clock. I'm gonna focus on time, but a lot of, of the things that I'm going to uh, uh, talk about will apply also to other parameters. But for concreteness, let's imagine some, some quantum system, which I wanna think of as a clock. It's going to be in some state row that evolves uh, in time according to the standard uh, you know, uh, um, evolution of um, operators in quantum mechanics. It's generated by some Hamiltonian. And after some time, I'd like to perform a measurement on this clock to read out what time the, you know, what time it is. So, you know, how accurately can a measurement of this clock after some time reveal the value that has been stored in, in the clock, you know, through the evolution uh, of the clock during the moment I initialized it to the moment I measured it. So that's kind of the fundamental question I want to consider today. Now, let me be a little more precise. How do I, what do I mean by uh, the accuracy to which I can measure this, um, uh, the T parameter? Well, I have a one parameter family of states, right? It's my quantum states. They're parameterized by this real number time. And what I want is I want, oh yeah. So of course, you know, uh, I guess all of you are familiar with quantum mechanics, right? A quantum state is a positive semi-definite operator. 
my observable will be some permission operator that I will want to measure and the estimate my procedure to estimate the value of T will be well the outcome of this um, um, sorry not this, like the uh, the expectation value of this observable with respect to my state right so now the question I want to ask is imagine that I uh, you know I'm allowed to measure different things you know I'm, I'm, I want to find an observable uh, which I'll call T and I want this observable to give me the smallest possible variance so it, you know I want the least possible fluctuations in this uh, in the outcomes of this observable and at the same time, I want this observable to reveal to me accurately in its expectation value what time it is locally around some reference time t0. So, you know, I'm going to fix some t0. I'm going to suppose that I know approximately what time it is. It's approximately t0. And what I want is my sensing procedure to work accurately to first order um, around that uh, time t0. Okay, so concretely, that means that I want this observable with the smallest possible variance. And I do want that this, the expectation value of this observable is this t0 plus whatever dt that I might have deviated from my reference time. All right, now if you squint at this, um, you can see that it's actually a very friendly optimization problem because it's convex. You can write it as a, you know, a quadratic, actually, optimization problem. You can write it as a semi-definite pro program if you're more familiar with semi-definite programs. So it's a it's a it's a type of problem that's actually uh, very friendly to deal with because you know you can use a lot. There's a big toolbox of convex optimization that you can use to try to gain some ideas about how this pro problem behaves. And concretely, you can actually solve it. You can actually solve this problem. And uh, here's the answer, right? The mid, the smallest possible variance that I can get is the inverse of some quantity that's known as the quantum Fisher information. So the definition of this quantum Fisher information is kind of I, I place it here. Um, I'm, I'm going to use it later, but it's the, the specific definition isn't that important. Uh, the, the important thing is that it's it really quantifies the smallest possible variant, the smallest possible error that I'm going to get by some observable that can reveal the value of the true of the parameter that I want to sense, right? So this is also called the Cromer Rao bound. You know, if you've, if you've heard of that, it's uh, it's the quantum Cromer Rao bound that would tell you that any sensing procedure would not uh, be able to perform better than this inverse of the quantum Fisher information. Okay, now in case this slide was a little technical, again, the important thing was we have a quantity, you know, well, we there's this quantity, the quantum Fisher information, that really tells you how accurately you can sense the value of a parameter to first order around some reference value of the parameter t0. It's the, the, the smallest possible square error is the inverse of the quantum Fisher information. Could, could I ask a question? In Absolutely. The, yeah, in the Heisenberg relation, there's the Fourier transform, but here there doesn't seem to be a Fourier transform. That is a great point. Um, I think it will come out. I maybe it will be clear uh, clear in one slide when I'm going to give you the example of a pure state. I think this is a different type of <clears throat> small, smallest uncertainty here. This is if I fix a given state, what is the, um, this, the, yeah, I, I haven't thought of it that way, actually. <laughs> it might be more clear in the next slide. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer right now. Uh, and I did forgot to mention, please do ask questions and uh, you know repeat questions if I don't uh, uh, answer them satisf satisfactorily. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy if you you know if you want to point out something. Great. Okay, so what I did want to show you is this the, the example of a pure state, and I think this might uh, this might clarify you know the uh, the issue in, in comparison with the uncertainty relation. So if I have a pure state that evolves according to some Hamiltonian, you know I've just collected the, what what I have on my previous slide here. Uh, we can compute what the uh, best sensitivity to the t parameter is. In this case, things simplify quite a lot, actually. You know, the complexity actually comes from if you have a mixed state. But if you have a pure state, uh, this, R, this R operator that goes into the definition of this Fisher information, it's just simply, it's simply the derivative of the state. And, it's, um, and I forgot to mention on the previous slide, this R operator also tells you what is the optimal uh, observable that you have to measure uh, to get the sensitivity that's advertised by this quantum Fisher information. So you can just work out this Fisher information. It's four times the variance of the state uh, of the Hamiltonian in the state that you're considering, 
right? So that means that the error, the optimal sensing accuracy will be the inverse uh, of the Hamiltonian. So in this case, this is a uh, this is time, but of course it would be the same same if I had position or momentum. I would have uh, you know I would have kind of some uncertainty in position, and then I would have the generating observable for that. So I guess that's where you'd come. That's where you'd have this Fourier transform come out, right? So here I'd have the um, the uncertainty in position would be something like the inverse of the variance of the momentum operator, because the momentum generates translations in position. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> From your previous slide. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is so maybe things are simpler to visualize in this pure state example because now uh, it's clear what this uh, Fisher information is. It's simply the variance of the Hamiltonian or you know whatever generates the shifts in the parameter that you want to sense. So uh, right. So that's the kind of simple case. Now let me give you a little uh, another interesting example. It's still a pure state, but now I'm looking at n spin one half particles. And you know, remember the accuracy is so. So the Hamiltonian is just given by the sum of individual Hamiltonian terms. I have the Pauli z operator on each term. Just think of each uh, particle being a two-level system with two energy levels. And uh, so the you can you can work out what the variance of this Hamiltonian is. It's, it scales like n squared, um, and, and omega is just the energy gap of each individual particle. So this Fisher information scales like n squared. So that means that your error in uh, estimating time actually scales like 1 over n. And when you stare at this, it's kind of remarkable because, you know, classically, if I want to estimate something, if I have a bunch of independent samples and I want to compute something like an average, you know that the, uh, the, uh, the, the standard deviation that I will, that, or the error that will be associated with taking averages on n samples will go like 1 over square root of n. And you know, in, that's and kind of here. What's interesting is that your error, if you're in the quantum case where you're allowed entangled states for your sensing protocol, you're actually allowed to have an error that scales like one over n instead of one over square root, square root n. And that's what's called this Heisenberg scaling. So that was kind of one of the big promises of quantum metrology. You can sense at, with a better scaling uh, than what you could do in principle uh, classically with independent samples. Now the the uh, the annoying thing about this great scaling is it's extremely fragile to noise. So if I have uh, a little bit of noise, then very quickly I will go back to the standard classical uh, scaling of the error of one over root n. So you know that begs the question of you know what are the ultimate sensitivity limits when I have some noise? Is there you know are there, are there ways that I can still recover this scaling? Are there ways where I can really quantify how much my noise will uh, is really um, uh, hindering my sensing task. So that's kind of one of the main major questions I want to ask today. Okay, so now the setting I'll be looking at again, um, it's imagine I have some, some pure state, it's in some, uh, it's in, I initialize it in some pure state at time t0. I let it evolve for some time around, so it's some value of t that's close to some reference value t0. And then I'm going to brutally apply a quantum operation onto it. So quantum, just a, qu a general quantum, a completely positive trace preserving map. It's any general quantum operation I can imagine, but I'm going to instantaneously apply it on Alice's clock after a time t. <clears throat> and that will define, I, I can imagine this as Alice sending her clock over a noisy channel over to B, to Bob. And that will define the state of the clock uh, at, after the channel. And the question is really how much sensitivity is there still left on Bob's end after I've applied the channel, as opposed to uh, the noiseless clock before the channel, channel was applied. So this is the setting I'd like to consider. And um, I'm going to appeal to a, a very standard, um, you know, a very worn, uh, worn out trick in quantum information theory. And in quantum information theory, there's this technique which consists in looking at not necessarily what you want to transmit or what you want to transmit to your uh, other party, but instead of looking at uh, what goes to the environment. There is this kind of magical theorem in, in quantum mechanics and quantum theory that tells you that purifications are unique. So, you know, you can, by looking at the uh, pure state that purifies, you know, your state, um, then you can say a lot of things about your, your state itself. So in this case, we're going to look at what happens to the environment. And this is described by uh, a complementary channel. So you can imagine this as if I had a bunch of a collection of spins here that, that, have, that undergo some type of decay. Well, if they decay, typically that would mean they emit photons because the whole process, you want that to be unitary. 
And well, you can imagine as the environment being all of those, the, the photons or the excitations that were emitted uh, out into some, some environment, right? So Eve is the environment, it gathers that information. We're gonna look at what information leaks over to Eve and deduce from that, that um, so that information is no longer available to Bob. That's kind of the, the, uh, the main idea. So the, the idea will be that kind of, if Eve is able to learn something about energy, of, about the energy of the clock that Alice has, then it will not be able to, um, uh, then the clock, sorry, then Bob's will not be able to, uh, to sense time accurately. Okay, so, so this is our setting again. I need to define, I still need to define something about energy, right? So I, uh, what I'm going to show you, uh, our main result is some trade-off uh, of between time sensitivity and energy sensitivity with respect to the quantum Fisher information. So I need to tell you what the energy parameter is. You know, I, and we know what the Hamiltonian is, but I still need to make a parameter out of it. it makes sense uh, in in our trade-off relation. So imagine the setting where uh, this is a setting I've described to you. I have this pure state that evolves unitarily. I want to sense this state with some uh, uh, observable t. This time evolution is generated by the Hamiltonian h. Right now I can imagine uh, something different. At the state here, what I can do is I take this observable that I use to sense time. And since it's a Hermitian observable, I can just use it to generate some different evolution locally right here. So I can, I can use some type of Schrodinger time evolution um, uh, with using this observable here as generator. And that will generate some other evolution in a different direction. I'm going to call that parameter eta. And you know the, the interesting thing is if you work it out, the optimal observable that you will need to sense this new parameter eta is the Hamiltonian itself, right? So these two observables are complementary in the sense, you know, in one, uh, in, in with one parameter, uh, one parameter is generated by the Hamiltonian and you can sense it optimally with the, this T operator locally at, at the state psi. And yeah, and it's complementary to the eta parameter in the sense that for the eta parameter, it's generated by the T observable and it's optimally sensed by the Hamiltonian, by H. <laughs> and since it's optimally sensed by H, I'm going to identify this eta as some type of energy parameter, right? Some, some kind of thing, some, some kind of parameter that's associated with energy, all right? So think of eta as some parameter that represents energy and it's defined locally um, around some time T zero at uh, around at psi, and it's complementary to uh, to time in the sense. All right, let's go back to our setup. And so um, after after Alice sends her clock over to Bob, you know Bob has some remaining sensitivity that's quantified by this Fisher information, right? It's the Fisher information of the result of the state after being sent over the channel. On the other hand, I can look at what goes to the environment, and Eve has some Fisher information about this complementary parameter eta that you can write in this way. And hat is just the channel that describes the information, how the information between Alice and Eve are related. And our main result is the following, there, is the following, is that these two sensitivities trade off exactly. So what that means is that if Bob is able to sense time as well as Alice, uh, as well as Alice can, that means that Eve gets absolutely no information about eta. She's not able to sense anything about the eta parameter. And conversely, if, he, if um, Eve is able to sense um, uh, the eta parameter optimally in the same way as Alice could sense uh, the eta parameter, then Bob cannot sense anything about time. And this is really inequality here. Uh, there are some edge cases that I didn't choose to, uh, to go into, but uh, uh, this holds basically, except for some edge cases, uh, very generally for whatever quantum, uh, quantum operation you choose to apply and for whatever pure state you, you, you start off with. Okay, so that's our main results. And now kind of the, um, oh, right, I, I even have some labels. So again, Bob's sensitivity to time trades off exactly with E's sensitivity to energy. And I forgot to mention that these, the, these kind of, you can see these um, uh, um, F Alice's as simply a way of making the units consistent, right? Because if I, if I want to compare a sensitivity to time with sensitivity to energy, in an equation like this, well, I will necessarily need some type of coefficients to make sure that at least the units are the same. Okay, now what can we do with this? You know, we have this um, equality that trades off exactly Bob's sensitivity to time with uh, Eve's sensitivity to um, this energy type parameter. And well, there were a bunch of different things that I, I thought I could go into. Uh, so I'm gonna start over with um, 
uh, just to give you an example application of, um, of this result to a single qubit. And I'll give you a, a little taste about how you can go by proving this uh, equality in full generality. And then I'm going to explore some um, applications in deriving bounds on the quantum Fisher information for mixed states, maybe in situations where it's kind of uh, uh, where you have states that are not really convenient to work with. And um, you can also generalize this uh, this result to not just time and energy, but to any two parameters, and the, you know the two parameters that are not even complementary in any uh, sense. So I'm going to kind of talk about that as well. And then the last part of my talk, I'll um, connect this uh, equality to quantum error correction and you know, how ideas from quantum error correction might be useful for quantum metrology. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so in this simple example, I, I wanted to present this example because it's, uh, you know, it's this, this uh, trade-off relation is pretty abstract. So if, if we look at a sing single qubit example, that might kind of concretize, that might give you a bit of a more concrete picture of what's going on. So imagine that I have my single qubit, the two energy level, uh, my, um, my, uh, my um, state vector evolves along the equator of the block sphere. So maybe it's initialized in the plus state and it evolves along this uh, uh, equator. After, so after some time t0, we've, we apply uh, our um, noise channel. In this case, I chose the noise channel to be a brutal dephasing of the state along the x-axis. So that means that anywhere you are on the block sphere, you just get projected onto this x-axis. You know, that corresponds to basically measuring x and just forgetting, and yeah, so measuring x and uh, averaging out um, the, the value. Yeah, just projecting al along the outcome of x. So uh, the resulting state is something like this. So it's, you can imagine this as a function of t, this is a state that would oscillate back and forth along this x-axis. Yeah. All right, so now you can also compute how much Eve, uh, how much information Eve gains about uh, this new, this energy parameter. And if you kind of dig through, you know, you remember I said it's generated by this t observable, and then you kind of relate again how um, you kind of plug in the different relations in, you'll, you'll, you'll realize that the, uh, the direction in which this uh, evolution goes is actually, again, given by this kind of anti-commutator of the Hamiltonian with uh, the state. And this thing is actually proportional to the sigma z observable. And that's something that, you know, this, this, the, um, that is annihilated by my noise channel. So my uh, Fisher information at Eve's end is just completely zero. So there is zero. So because Eve learns absolutely nothing about the eta parameter, we can directly deduce from our main results that Bob gets no sensitivity to time. All right, and you can actually compute that directly in this case um, if you work out what Bob's sensitivity to time is using this definition of the Fisher information that I showed you on the earlier on the earlier slide. You will see that indeed it's Bob's sensitivity is the same as Alice's sensitivity. All right, so that's just for the single qubit example. I also wanted to give you a, a little taste of how you could, how we could prove this on uh, this trade-off relation. So the main, so the three main ingredients that you need for this proof is, oh, sorry. So first is a um, an expression for the Fisher information that is kind of a simplified version of the optimization problem that I showed you on one of my first slides. You remember, I defined the, the on the slide where I defined my Fisher information. I I showed you that the Fisher information is essentially given by some convex optimization problem. Well, you can simplify that problem a little bit uh, in terms to, to get an expression for the Fisher information, and you get some variational expression like this, you know, some quadratic or semi-definite uh, program like this. Um, there's there's another way of defining the quantum Fisher information, and it turned they turned out to be the same. And then that's by looking at the second order of what's known as the quantum fidelity of quantum states. So the fidelity is a distinguishability measure of quantum states. And it turns out that if you look at nearby states and you look at the second order expansion of the fidelity, it turns out that you get the quantum Fisher information. So for the proof of this trade-off relation, it turned out that uh, starting off with this and using Ullmann's theorem, which is a famous theorem in quantum information, that tells you that you know the fidel this fidelity is actually the best possible overlap you can get in, with purifications of your two states that you're looking at. Um, if you use Ullmann's uh, theorem, kind of and expand what here these uh, different states are after application of the channel, um, 
then you so you, you first write the Fisher information with this fidelity, then use Ullman's theorem, and then you kind of um, work your way through. You'll actually end up with one of these optimization expressions, but now for each side. So that will connect Bob's um, uh, Fisher information with respect to time to Eve's Fisher information with respect to this complementary parameter. And then there are some coefficients that we've dry, that you have to drag along and that will give you these normalization factors. So of course, this is not a, this is not a proof uh, in itself. It's just like a taste of the main ingredients that come in and you know, how they need to be assembled to get to the, to the proof of this statement. Okay, so you know, what can, one thing that we can do with uh, this trade-off relation is to uh, say, well, can we use this to get bounds on the quantum Fisher information when uh, when you have states that are kind of harder to compute the Fisher information for? And um, so here's the here's the setting again, right? We have Alice that sends her clock over to B to Bob, and Eve gets uh, you know, whatever leaks to the environment. Well, I can imagine applying. Imagine that I came and I applied an extra channel over on Eve's end. I post. I I, I just processed Eve's information. Uh, another uh, for, for another bit. Well, we know that the it, it's intuitive that the quantum Fisher information that Eve prime now the output of this extra channel uh, Eve prime can only have less sensitivity to this eta parameter than what Eve had, right? Uh, because otherwise, you know, the, the, if I apply some quantum operation, um, that that could have that could have been that you know, I can't increase my sensitivity by applying some uh, quantum channel onto my system. Otherwise, you know, I could derive a better sensing scheme for my original uh, state. So if there's some channel that, uh, that I can apply, the sensitivity can only decrease. And so plugging that into our trade-off relation gives you an upper bound on, the, uh, on Bob's Fisher information for time. So, you know, before we had an equality, but now we have an inequality because, you know, I just replaced this Eve's Fisher information by now the Fisher information for Eve prime. And the reason I might want to do that is that maybe now the Fisher information for Eve prime is much easier to compute for some reason than the Fisher information um, of Eve. And one example, a thing I could do is I could enforce some symmetry. Imagine that I had some uh, some uh, some state on Eve that I would expect to have some symmetry, but I'm not sure if it's actually there. I can just symmetrize the state on Eve to make it uh, to to ensure that the symmetry holds, for instance. Uh, so let me give you two two yeah, another examples. question. Of course, yeah. That that looks argument looks very much like the analysis of the Legendre transform, uh, and I wonder if they're two are connected. Um, do you mean as in uh, you know finding the best possible upper bounds or best possible lower bounds yeah. in terms of a? Um, well, that definitely you know that definitely is the case when you look at these. Uh, where was my proof here? These expressions for the Fisher information, right? So in this case, you have uh, the you know the optimization problem, which is you you can refer to as a primal problem, and this is the Lagrange dual problem of this uh, optimization problem. So it definitely occurs here, and it might actually also transpose. Um, I would not I would not be surprised if you could actually uh, 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 plug in some choice of uh, observables based on n prime in this earlier expression for the for the fish information it's definitely possible that you that is actually the case so that indeed this is indeed a, a lagrange dual type um, uh, argument yes that definitely makes sense um, so yeah uh, i was going to give you uh, two examples where you might want to uh, process eve's information further so for instance you you might have a setting where Eve can get lots of things, maybe she gets, um, you know, some. Maybe have a, uh, maybe Alice has a large many-body system, and a lot of atoms can decay, and somehow, but maybe the decay probability is small. So you know, there's a chance that Eve would receive a lot of photons, but really that could that would only happen with a very small probability. That could be a situation um, that might be interesting. So one thing you can do is instead of uh, looking at all the different possibilities that Eve could uh, could have, all of the different noise events that can happen, well, maybe you want to only look at part of them. So one thing you can do is take the uh, map and uh, take the consider the post processing map on Eve's system that just discards events, that just says that okay, I don't, I'm not interested in events where I had kind of some weird photons with uh, with a very small probability. I just want to keep the inter interesting events. 
and that actually results you in being in a smaller Hilbert space after uh, after the process. So uh, you can kind of choose, can pick some important events that you want to consider and uh, discard the rest. And you can formalize that by applying some completely positive trace preserving map onto each system. And sorry, your trace is not increasing in this case, map on each system. And now the, the effect of that is that you have a state on the Hilbert space that is potentially much smaller uh, than Eve. So it might, it might be easier if you want to use any uh, some numerical techniques to solve, to, to uh, compute your official information on Eve prime system rather than Eve system, simply because the Hilbert space uh, is much smaller. So that would be one example. And uh, another, um, another example would be, imagine that I have amplitude damping noise on a single qubit. So imagine that I have a qubit with, with its states pointing in the plus x direction on the blob sphere. And imagine that I, I'm subjecting this qubit to amplitude damping noise. So that, so that would mean that it's, it's noise that makes you decay to the ground states. So what happens is that, um, so with some small, you know, with some small probability, you decay to the ground state, uh, but you, you kind of move a little bit towards the ground state in general for the output to Bob. And if you work out what the complementary channel of this noise channel is, it's just something that very, with very high probability sends you close to the ground state. Uh, so you know it's uh, uh, so so even most of the time gets almost the, always the ground state, but might be something close to the ground state. And if you work out what Eve gets here, you'll see that the density matrix is actually not diagonal. It still has a little bit of coherence, you know, of some off diagonal terms, and those are a little annoying when you want to compute the quantum Fisher information. Computing the quantum Fisher information is much easier if your state is, if you know the diagonal form, you know, if you know the basis in which your state is diagonal. So one thing you can do is simply brutally kill all of the off-diagonal terms of your um, density matrix on Eve's end. You know, that's a perfectly valid trace preserving, completely positive map that, you know, forgets a little bit of information and just collapses everything on, along the z-axis on this single qubit. You could do that if I have many qubits, I can do that for all of the qubits that Eve gets. And now I have a state that's diagonal in some uh, simple basis, my computational basis. And so I could, in principle, uh, it might be much easier to compute the quantum Fisher information for that state instead of the state of Eve. And of course, these two examples can be combined. I might have amplitude damping. Uh, I might have many systems subject to amplitude damping. And I might want to decohere everything. So to kind of do this dephasing projection along the z-axis. But at the same time, I might only want to keep the most or um, the most uh, significant events most uh, that happen with highest probability, maybe where I only, if I have a very small decay probability, I would only have to keep all of the events where I have at most, you know, k decays for some small uh, value of k. That might be sufficient to get good bounds on the on Bob's quantum Fisher information. Okay, and so. Um, <clears throat> Another direction you can kind of go from this main result is, okay, I talked about time, I talked about energy. What about uh, general observables? You know, imagine that I have two observables, A and B, and they generate some parameters. I'll call them little a and little b. Uh, can I say anything about how the Fisher information, how the sensitivity of these two um, uh, parameters trade off? So right off the bat, you you know, we can tell that. We don't expect some general trade-off in the same way that we had, you know, uh, before. We, we don't expect necessarily these two to trade off. For instance, A might be an observable that acts on one system. B might be an observable that acts on an independent system. So in in, the, in, in that case, or if A and B commute, you know, we wouldn't expect there to be any significant trade-off between how well um, we can sense one or the other. So actually, it's captured by this generalized trade-off that relation that we could show where there's this extra term. So we have that Bob's sensitivity to the A parameter trades off with Eve's sensitivity to the B parameter. But now uh, we have this you know, one like we had before, but we have this extra term where now you have the commutator of A and B that appears. So this commutator really um, quantifies you know, the degree of how two observables are compatible or incompatible in quantum mechanics. And you can see that if A and B are such that they kind of they're maximally incompatible in the sense that they saturate the standard uh, Robertson uncertainty relation of quantum mechanics, like position and momentum or uh, the Hamiltonian and the T observable I defined before. Well, this extra term actually vanishes. So we get the same type of trade off relation as we had before. You know, the uh, Fisher information of Bob's Fisher information to uh, the A parameter trades off with Eve's Fisher information to the B parameter exactly, uh, um, you know, with 
this one on the right hand side it's now 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 it's only an inequality instead of an exact equality um, but we have the same trade-off um, uh, behavior but now for general observables you actually it actually depends here we have this extra term that depends on the commutator between the two observables a and b right so this is just a generalization of a uh, of the of our main results that is now valid for any two observables we only lost something along the way in the sense that here we have an inequality and no longer an actual equality as we had before. Okay. Now, I, I wanted to shift towards kind of the second part of my talk uh, where I want to bring in some ideas of quantum error correction. Okay. Now, so quantum error correction is a process where uh, if I have some, some quantum state, say some quantum state rho, and I want to protect it from noise, well, you want to do something like I, I would want to re encode it in some redundant fashion on multiple systems in a way that if I expose these systems to noise, well, there might be hope that I, there will be some recovery operation that would make sure that I recover the initial state that I had before. Uh, you know. So the, the kind of definition, if you like, of a quantum error correcting code, um, if I fix some noise channel, would be something like, well, it's an encoding such that if I apply the encoding and then the noise, well, then there exists a recovery channel so that I can apply onto the uh, corrupted state here, such that I recover my initial state, um, say exactly, if it's an exact quantum error correcting code. Now, you know, natural question is, can we use quantum error correction to error correct a clock? And, you know, is there a way of, uh, uh, of using a code such that, uh, well, if, I, if my clocks, some of my clocks get corrupted, I can still recover my original clock and and keep my uh, the accuracy that I had at the beginning. And it turns out that this is actually um, equivalent, you know, being able to error correct the clock is equivalent to the, uh, to the encoding being commuting with the action of time evolution. So this may be, you know, if you, if you stare at the, at the setting, it might be obvious, or you, you can work it out. Basically, it's important that the encoding doesn't, is, isn't sensitive to what, uh, which time I choose to apply the encoding. Because otherwise, you know, I would mess up the time information that's actually stored uh, in the clock and that I want to convey through the whole use of quantum error correction. The annoying thing about uh, time covariant codes is that basically they don't exist, you know, uh, at least not in finite dimensions and not if they're exact. And that is an actually pretty profound statement that's, uh, uh, that's basically the easton knill theorem. You know, easton knill were concerned about quantum computation. They used different terms. They, they used different words. But really what they showed what there is that there is no possible operation that you can apply on each individual um, qubits here such that or each individual subsystems such that you generate some logical uh, continuous transformation at the logical level of the information that you want to encode so that's kind of annoying in terms of uh, using quantum error correction to uh, for clocks because you know um, coherent codes don't really exist you can ask the question what if we relax some assumptions here. What if we we ask to only be able to recover uh, my state, not exactly like I had before, but approximately. Let's put in some error parameter epsilon and ask that row primes uh, has to be just epsilon close to row. Well, in that case, you can kind of derive a quantitative bound on how um, on how inaccurate your code has to be if it does admit a symmetry like that. So if I have some, if my if my code is time covariant. And my Hamiltonian here is just some individual Hamiltonian terms, uh, hi, one on, uh, i for each system. Well, then you can prove that there's a lower bound. The, the code must be bad, must be a bad code. And the way you can quantify that is by lower bounding this uh, error parameter of the code. And it depends on things like the, uh, the range of energy values that you can have on your, on your logical level and on the physical level. And it depends also on the number of subsystems in your code. So there's some quantitative bound for that. But then there's another thing you can ask that, um, uh, you know, this, what I asked here was that rho prime is epsilon close to rho, but I asked, I required that again, using some information theoretics some quantum information theoretic measure that is in principle stronger than what I would require in metrology. In quantum metrology, I don't necessarily care about recovering the, the state of the clock exactly as it was or very close to what it was before. All I care about is that the clock is still as sensitive to the noise, to sorry, as sensitive to time as it was before the encoding. So, you know, maybe it's, um, 
uh, maybe, maybe there's something you can do where you don't recover the clock exactly, but you still, you're still uh, sensitive to the time the same way as, or very close to how you were sensitive before. Um, maybe you're able to protect the sensitivity to time, even if you can't recover the clock uh, close to the initial state. And that's basically what our uh, quantum fissure information trade-off relation does. And really this kind of, to loop back to our main result, this, this was really one of the main motivations for this, uh, this time energy uncertainty relation project in the first place. And then we had this bound on this, uh, this bound on the performance of covariant codes. And we thought, well, you know, this is a bit too stringent, this requirement that to recover the state uh, to up to epsilon, that's a little too stringent for quantum metrology. What is, what happens if we relax that and just and ask how sensitive can we remain after the application of the noise? And that's how, you know, that is what our main uh, trade-off relation of quantum Fisher information quantifies. Okay, now the the point is, okay, so how can we connect that still to quantum error correction, right? Let's, uh, let's see with quantum error correction. We know that with quantum error correction, we can fight noise in quantum metrology uh, if we kind of uh, exploit the fact that maybe here the Hamiltonian isn't exactly, so here I assume that the Hamiltonian acts on each qubit individually and that um, the errors is exactly, you know, the loss of one of these subsystems. Now, if the setting is a little different, we, we actually know that it is possible to use uh, quantum error correction to help, you know, to improve sensitivity. And in this case, uh, what, what was shown by um, a series of papers was that you can recover the same scaling, this magical quantum Heisenberg limit scaling that you get with quantum uh, sensing. You can recover the same scaling in the presence of noise as long as the Hamiltonian of your system is not in the linear span of uh, the uh, operators corresponding to the noise that can be applied. <laughs> so imagine if I have some noise uh, that is an operator, some Krauss operator, say, I can look at the linear span of all of the Krauss operators. And as long as the Hamiltonian does not lie in this linear span, then there exists some scheme based on quantum error correction that will recover the Heisenberg scaling that, uh, that, we, we, that we like in quantum metrology. And really the intuition behind this is to say, well, if, if the Hamiltonian is in the linear span of the error operators, well, the, the, that means that the Hamiltonian can be confused for noise. So, you know, if I, um, whatever scheme I have, if my noise, if my Hamiltonian, if my generator and my noise operators are sim too similar, or if they're even, you know, if they're parallel, there is just no way to tell which one it is, you know, is, because if I have some noise, uh, if I have some state change, I have no idea if it's actually the noise that generated it or if it's actually the signal that I wanted to measure. So, you know, the, there, there has to be a way of distinguishing them. And the way of distinguishing them here is to make sure that the Hamiltonian is not in this uh, linear span. <laughs> so the question you can ask here is, okay, we have a, sch a scheme based on quantum error correction to uh, protect the Heisenberg scaling in the presence of noise. Did we actually need a full quantum error correcting code to do this, you know, or is it, is it possible to do something like this with a simpler scheme? And that's kind of where um, we come back to our uh, trade-off relation. And we can ask, well, what is the, what, under what conditions do we lose, does Bob have maximal sensitivity to time? So in, under what conditions does the noise channel not kill any sensitivity at all? So, you know, if I, I can just set the second term to zero, and if my second term here is equal to zero, then I know that Bob has the same sensitivity as Alice and the channel didn't actually degrade the system in terms of being sensitive to T. All right, so you can show that this term is equal to zero if and only if this particular condition here holds. So I'm gonna pack, unpack that for you a little bit. These are the noise operators. So the cross operators of the noise channel. Um, think of them as you know what can go wrong with your state. And these pi and Z, they, they are defined in terms of some virtual space that I'm going to think of some virtual qubits. You know, I'm going to think of the state, my, my, the state of my clock, psi, and I'm going, I'm going to look at the state h psi where I've applied the Hamiltonian onto psi, so that's some other state. I'm going to look at the two-dimensional Hilbert space spanned by those two states, right? I'm going to de denote by pi the projector onto that two-dimensional space, and I'm going to denote by z the logical Pauli z operator in that space if I suppose that my psi is actually the plus x direction. Then this condition here tells you that essentially when acting on this 
think of this as some type of code space. When acting on this code space, well, uh, the operators, the noise operators should not be able to generate anything that, that is parallel to the Z uh, logical operator. Okay. So the, maybe the most, when an informative way of looking at this is by looking at the corresponding quantum error correction conditions. So in quantum error correction, there are the famous canola flam conditions that tell you when you have a quantum error correcting code. And these conditions state that um, you, you if you have a scheme that encodes some state in some subspace uh, and the subspace uh, projector is high, then this thing defines a code if and only if um, the noise operators, when standards by this projector, gives you something that's proportional to uh, this projector. So it's proportional to the identity within that subspace. So that means that noise operators can only generate something that looks like the identity on that projector. So what we have here is something more general, right? It's, uh, it, we don't ask this, we don't have this stringent requirement that these noise operators must look like the identity on the, sub, on the code space. What we, what we merely ask them to not look like Z. So they could look like X or they could look like Y. They merely, they should not look like Z. That's the only thing. Whereas here, they really have to look like the identity on that space. Okay, so these guys, I, we've been calling them metrological codes. They are more general than quantum error correcting codes. Okay, so they're, in principle, you can imagine there, there could be schemes that are not quantum error correcting codes, but you know, something more general that could uh, help you conserve uh, your sensitivity to time. And the example I showed you earlier, you know, when I defined the Fisher information, I showed you uh, an example with a single qubit uh, subject to complete dephasing along the plus x axis. Well, that thing happened to be a metrological code, right? Uh, because you know we computed what Eve uh, got, uh, what what Eve, what in the sensitivity Eve obtained to energy to this eta parameter. We saw that it was equal to zero. So you know we know that the second term in this trade-off relation is equal to zero. And what, what I'm going to, we, what we can check to is we can also check that the condition that I just showed you for being a metrological code, that this thing is indeed satisfied. You know, if we have now pi is just, since I already have a qubit, pi is just the identity. Z is the simple, is the usual Z operator on this qubit. And the noise operator, you know, remember I chose to deface completely the, uh, to project everything along the X axis that corresponds to a measurement of X. Of the X observable. So the, the Krauss operators are just either the identity or X. Um, you can view them this way. And so that means that if I uh, plug in here identity or X, well, you see that you know they'll give me either trace of Z or trace of something that's proportional to Y. So that indeed is equal to zero. And so the conditions for being a metrological code are indeed fulfilled. Another example of something that, that, that's a metrological code would be something like this. So imagine that I have a, a bunch of systems and uh, a bunch of qubits and that they, uh, imagine that I kind of have a graph describing interactions between, uh, any two, uh, between different pairs of qubits and each edge of this graph is a single ZZ interaction. So a sigma Z uh, times sigma Z on, you know, a pair of sigma Z's on each uh, qubit. So you could say, what, what states could I use to try to sense uh, with this Hamiltonian? So, so this defines a Hamiltonian. It's just a sum of all of these pairs of um, uh, all of these terms. Each term is just a two-body ZZ interaction. Um, what if I started with a state like this? Imagine I took a super superposition of all zeros plus some, co some configuration of the, of the qubits here that violates as many as possible as these interaction terms as I can. So that's something that uh, would have a large variance of energy. So in principle, if I didn't have any noise, that would, that would give me a good sensitivity. But you can check that you know, if I plug in this, uh, this into our conditions, you can check that this quantity is not equal to zero. So that in principle is something that is prone to sensitivity loss. So it's, that's, uh, that's not something that is well protected against uh, noise. So I'm looking here at an, a single error at a single site. You know, it's a very simple model. If instead you look at this slightly more complicated state, where I now have not just a superposition of all zeros and some configuration that violates a lot of interaction terms, but let's look at all zeros plus all ones plus some configuration that violates a lot of interaction terms plus the complement the complement of that configuration. So I didn't what I denote here by cn bar is the string cn where I flipped all the zeros into ones and, and the other way around. 
So if I look at this um, state, well, then you can plug into this um, uh, this uh, metrological code condition and see that indeed um, this condition is satisfied if I have um, in in the sense that if I if I remove one of my qubits from the system, while well, the the remaining qubits will support a state that still has the same sensitivity to time as what was there before I removed that qubit. Okay, so let me move on to kind of the example, putting all, kind of all of these different ideas together. Now, uh, in this example, I just have a plot here I wanted to show you. So this is the um, <clears throat> so this is the Fisher information that I computed for uh, for Bob in terms of uh, as a function of how Bob's how sensitive Bob is to time for this one D spin chain with nearest neighbor ZZ interactions, and we looked at this. Um, state where you have you know, zero, a superposition of all zeros and then some alternate, alternating sequence of 0, 1, 0, 1. So this violates a lot of these interaction terms. This has a huge variance in energy. So without any noise, it's, um, it's uh, maximally sensitive here. Um, but, it, but, um, but you see that if I increase, uh, now if I start subjecting my spins to noise and now my noise model is this amplitude damping noise model that I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a model where your state decays to the ground state with some probability, essentially. Then you see that this decays, um, you know, you lose some sensitivity as I increase the value of my noise parameter. I also plotted by comparison the sensitivity of the classical or, you know, the uh, uncorrelated state that you would imagine um, where you have just all individual spins pointing in the plus x direction. Now the other state that I mentioned uh, early, uh, just before is uh, is it has the same variance, right? So without any noise, it has the same sensitivity here, but it is more robust to the noise because you can see that you know if I increase the noise parameter, um, well then it doesn't decay at the same um, speed. It actually decays at an order in p that's lower. It decays to second order in p here, whereas this other state directly had a loss to first order in p. And so here what I plotted is the upper bound that um, I obtained by uh, the, the procedure that I showed you uh, before, you know, by post-processing Eve's information by an extra channel, both by uh, killing all of the off diagonals as well as keeping only a, a certain number of main events. And um, so we can see that this state here kind of has a, um, uh, has a sensitivity that is better protected against this noise parameter here. So yeah, I've been dragging on for pretty for a pretty long time already. That, that, that was the bulk of what I wanted to um, talk about today. I still have a conclusion slide that I, uh, with a few points that I still wanted to uh, mention, uh, but didn't necessarily want to go into deep detail to avoid dragging on. So the main, maybe, you know, one of the main points of this trade-off relation was really to point out that a good clock state is really one that can hide uh, the, its energy from the environment. And th that's not really a surprise, but really kind of the, the novel thing about uh, this trade-off relation is that it really quantifies that in terms of this quantum Fisher information. Uh, the other thing is that this trade-off relation is very reminiscent of a type of uh, uncertainty relation that's called the uh, entropic uncertainty relations. So if you, if you look at, you know, there are different types of uncertainty relations in quantum mechanics. And one type that I didn't mention was the, uh, was, was for instance, if I look at a system and I look at uh, hypothetically, if I measured it in some say uh, X observable and uh, I would get some distribution. And if I measured it in some other observable Y, I would get some other distribution. And you can ask what the entropies of these distributions are and how they trade off. And it turns out you can write uncertainty relations in terms of these entropies. So in a certain sense, uh, our trade-off relation is a quantum Fisher information counterpart to those entrop entropic uncertainty relations. Now, the, 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 another point I wanted to make was that the model that I assumed is kind of very idealistic and simplistic because, well, I have Alice evolves in a very nice noiseless setting and after some time, brutally sends everything to Bob over an instantaneous noise channel. Now, what can, you, can we say anything about situations where the noise actually is applied at the same time, you know, all along the evolution of, uh, of the, the clock already on Alice's end? And that's something that's hard, that's trickier to uh, analyze with the type of techniques that we had. So, you know, it's, you can, by, by adding a few assumptions, you can reduce this kind of Markovian or Lindbladian open system evolution 
where you have your noise being applied at the same time as your Hamiltonian. Um, you know, if under some commutation relations, for instance, or if you have some assumptions there, you can still kind of reduce that to our ideal scenario. Um, otherwise, you know, we can't always say something interesting. And uh, so, of course, another thing that um, I thought would be interesting was what happens if you have more than uh, one parameter and it's a complement to sense? You know, what if you have a collection of parameters you want to sense simultaneously? Is there some nice multi-parameter version of these trade-off relations? And um, kind of two further points are kind of more practical. One is, well, there is um, there is evidence that having strong interactions in your system can really aid your sensitivity. And that's kind of underscored by the fact that if you, by this kind of theoretical study where you see that if I have, um, you know, by the easton Knill theorem basically telling you that if I have, if I lose one system, well, I, if I only have a Hamiltonian acting on uh, individual subsystems, then I will confuse, I'll easily confuse my signal, my noise for signal and vice versa. Whereas if I have interacting Hamiltonians, well, it's going to be harder to confuse the loss of you know, the, your noise from the signal. So there's evidence that having interacting systems might uh, improve your sensitivity also from the experimental uh, side as well with NV setters or, you know, if you look at lattice atomic clocks. And one last point that I've been thinking about uh, recently is everything I've been telling you in terms of the quantum Fisher information. You remember at the beginning, I said there's this expectation value. We ask this T observable to reveal the true value of the parameter in its expectation value. And that is something that means that in practice, if I wanted to measure this observable, I would have to prepare my experiment, run my experiment many times, gather some samples, take the average, for instance, of those samples, and estimate this expectation value in some sense. Uh, what happens if this, you know, there are, what happens is that there are some settings where this distribution of outcomes of the optimal sensing observable is actually uh, pretty unfriendly and weird and has some rare events that contribute significantly to the value, to, to your expectation value. So that means that if I have access to finite samples, it might be difficult to, uh, to estimate that expectation value correctly. And the sensitivity limits might actually be very different if you have only access to a finite number of samples from, you know, in your sensing experiment. So that opens kind of a new path of uh, metrology and sensing to, you know, out, away from the quantum Fisher information to something that's more one shot of the nature, you know, that's that's uh, where you're, you have to really be careful about the uh, finite uh, nature of the samples. So that's something that I've, I've been working on also recently with some colleagues here in Berlin. Um, so yeah, thanks for your attention. I've been dragging on long enough. Uh, so yeah, thanks. Thank you, Philip, for a really beautiful overview. It's a <laughs> wonderful talk. And I think now that, um, we can uh, stop sharing your screen for the moment and see the audience who I'm sure will have many questions and open the floor for discussion. Sure. So when you ask a question, please turn on your video so we can see you. Who would like to start? Or maybe I should start by asking, um, could you give us the archive number for the latest work that you described? Oh yeah, so you the the um, the time energy uncertainty relation? Yes. Yeah. For the yeah, so the the archive link for the talk definitely I can. Uh, let me look it up. I'm going to paste it in the chat. I forgot to add, to include it on the slides. I can do that for. Uh, um, uh, I think I'm going to send you a, a version of my slides afterwards. I can include the archive number on the slide. That's great. Slide. Great. Uh, I just got it. There we go. So it, it was a paper that started off kind of as a quick follow up of this um, uh, covariant codes project with, uh, with this crowd um, at Caltech. And it kind of grew during the pandemic out of control to over 100 pages. So you don't have to read all of it. Uh, <laughs> to kind of go to, we try to organize it in a way that's, that you don't have to read everything to you know, get to the information that you might be interested in. So are there any other questions or comments? Hi, um, can I have a question? Oh, yes, Leon. Uh, yeah. 
Hi, Professor. I just wonder, uh, do we have some like classical uh, correspondence for this feature information? Because I think like entropy or some Watson's distance, they can be defined classically. Can we have defined this classically? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's a classical concept originally, right? Uh, I, everything I said is quantum because I'm, you know, I, I've evolved in quantum information theory and my background is quantum information theory. But everything is classical. You know, the Cromer Rao bound is classical originally. Uh, you can find the uh, Fisher information as uh, you define it a little differently, but it's, it's it's the same type of idea. You know, it's uh, you it's the variance of the score. You know, it's like you kind of you have these classical probabilistic um, uh, concepts that you that really kind of map over to uh, to um, to um, kind of this quantum setting. You can also write I. Maybe under some assumptions, I am blanking out. I think the quantum Fisher information, you can also write it as the maximal classical Fisher information over measurement outcomes, over all possible measurement outcomes of your quantum system. So you can even directly connect the two uh, notions in that sense. I actually forgot to mention that. That's a great point. Yeah, I sorry for not thinking about that. OK, thank you. Thank you, Leo. Hey. I could, could I ask you about uh, parallels between classical and quantum? For example, uh, the the way we understand noise uh, in classical signal processing, you 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 have a good understanding of what need to detect noise and good mathematical models for what noise is. And uh, 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 could you explain a little bit about uh, parallels uh, from classical to quantum uh, for those those two questions? <laughs> Could you repeat the yeah. question, Philippe, because it's very hard uh, to hear. Uh, uh, parallels from classical to quantum uh, with respect to detecting noise and with respect to the math mathematical model for noise. You mentioned a little bit uh, Mark Markov chain interpretations of noise, but uh, but if you could, exp I mean, in classical signal processing, we, there's, there's a big theory about uh, how to model noise and how to detect noise. And, <laughs> and uh, so the parallels for the quantum case to yeah. those classical theories. That, that's a great question. Uh, I've used noise as a, you know, as, a, as gen a generic term of, you know, some unwanted thing in your signal that, that you want to, in your state that you want to measure. I've, I, the model I use for noise is extremely simple. You know, the, it's uh, the, the models that you have in, uh, for, as far as I, I, I imagine I can tell from signal processing are way more, uh, you know, uh, elaborate and complete and um, uh, involved. The, the, you know, so imagine that I, so the classical uh, analog of the noise model that I, I have here is imagine that I store, uh, I store some states, I store some information on my hard drive and then someone comes or some, I don't know, my hard drive undergoes some process. And then I look at it again the day after and maybe some bits might have been corrupted. You know, there's some probability, there's some transition probability from before to after. There is some big stochastic matrix that tells me uh, what my state afterwards is if, you know, my, given what my, you know, what my initial state might have been. So this N that I've been writing is, if you like, it's the quantum version of a stochastic matrix. It's just one big mapping of the state I had before to what I have now. And I assumed it acts in instantaneously. Uh, you know, so I, I'm not, I'm, I didn't go at all in terms of you know, trying to define some power spectrum or any concept of that type. It's really some instantaneous action of some uh, un undesirable environmental effects that, some, that degrades my state from ideal to noisy. So in that sense, it's yeah. very simple. You say stochastic matrix, would, would, that, would that be Gaussian or semicircle or <laughs> uh, free, free probability type noise or what kind? Well, I, I, I don't have enough background in uh, signal processing, I guess, to be able to uh, say exactly. It, it, the, what I can say is it's any, it's literally any, like I, I'm, so the model is, like if I'm, uh, is, this is finite dimensional quantum mechanics. So I guess the classical analog would really be a discrete probability distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, here, in, in this case, you're allowed, so there's no assumption on the noise mod, on the noise channel itself. So mm -hmm. it's for an arbitrary quantum uh, map. Mm -hmm. So the, the classical corresponding statement would be, it would, it's, it would be an arbitrary stochastic matrix. Oh, okay. So any matrix that maps probability distributions to probability distributions. Mm -hmm. 
uh, other ways to simulate uh, the detection of uh, uh, of these these quantities. <laughs> Well, you know, it's uh, hopefully they describe how accurately you can uh, sense the uh, uh, <laughs> parameter. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, so actually, you, you have a point. You have a, you're ha you're raising a very good point, uh, which again I didn't go into, which is okay. I you know in this in the definition of the quantum Fisher information, I asked what's the best possible measurement that I can devise to um, sense a parameter. Of course, in practice. You can never exactly implement that perfect measurement that you want to, you know, that this formalism tells you you should measure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how uh, how can you get as close as possible to that measurement? Or, you know, how can you optimize? Um, how can you say, well, given some constraints on what I can measure, what is the best possible sensitivity that I can uh, get to a parameter? I think there are some papers on that. I'm not sure I would be able to point to specific ones. Uh, there, there's been a lot of research on that also on the quantum side. Um, but, but the point is, uh, one of the takeaways is that because uh, this, this problem formulation is a relatively friendly convex optimization problem, uh -huh. if you have constraints like, okay, I, what I can measure has to be, if you have some semi-definite or convex uh, um, uh, constraints for, for that represent that, then you can in principle just plug them into your problem. Okay. So in principle, that's, uh, that is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great questions. Are there other questions? Anybody else? I have some questions, but I talk offline. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you again, Philly, for absolutely wonderful talk. And we look forward Thanks to for having all me. your future progress. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for you know holding on this long. <laughs>